He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes, under, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, at this point, this is, this is where I want to uh, uh, concentrate on a couple of verses this morning. Uh, in verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This idea of God being able to do exceedingly above all that we can uh, ask, above all that we can think, uh, above all we can imagine. You know, when, when Jesus came, the Jews had a preconceived notion of what they expected the Messiah to do. And because he didn't do the things they expected, they rejected him. They, uh, they were looking for uh, God's promises, but they misunderstood what those promises were. And so uh, <clears throat> when Jesus came, the things that he did and uh, the, uh, the extent of the blessing that he brought with him uh, completely passed over them. They, they missed the point. They, they missed the whole lesson there. But uh, this concept of God being able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. This is something that has been proved over and over in the course of the Bible. The history that we read of God's actions. Uh, back in verse 8 of this same chapter, uh, it talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. In other words, uh, what God had in mind was not the same thing that man has in mind. What God had in mind was something that man didn't come up with. Uh, the, the, the very idea, at least among the, the Jews of that day, the very idea that God would find the Gentiles acceptable, that was out of the question something that they wouldn't accept. Uh, the very idea that, that the law of Moses was insufficient, that it was not God's final word to man, that it was not the end of God revealing himself. You know, uh, in this same chapter, uh, we read, um, oh, last week and probably the week before, this uh, word mystery, the mystery of God's revelation, the mystery of what he, uh, of what he uh, uh, had brought through Christ. Well, if we look back in the Old Testament and we follow through with God's actions, follow through all of the things that he did at various times, we find that God always gave man enough knowledge, enough understanding, enough of his revelation of himself for man to do what was pleasing to God. Before the law of Moses, we have what God had spoken to Noah, what God had spoken in the time of, of uh, Adam, and man lived according to those things if he lived pleasing to God. And it was possible. Remember the man named Enoch? It says he walked with God. How did he walk with God 
except that God told him how to walk, except that God showed him the direction that he wanted to walk, him to walk. Because remember, God was no longer coming down to the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden had been closed. <laughs> Man was no longer there with God physically coming down and walking in the garden with Adam. That was over. But that doesn't mean that God left man without instruction. Remember what the Bible says about uh, uh, Abel, that he still speaks to us? How does he speak to us? He shows us that you can do what God commands, or at least according to the information that God had given to that time. Abel was doing what was right in the sight of God, and, it, and God was pleased with it. And Cain didn't do that, and God was not pleased with it. So we have a, a long history of God showing various bits of information, but always enough. There was enough that God gave prior to the time of Moses. There was enough that God had given man for man to live in a way that was pleasing to God. And then came the law of Moses. And under the law of Moses, if they kept it, they could be pleasing to God. But when Christ came, the doors were thrown open. There was more than man could imagine. More than man thought would happen. So in verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Do you realize that what God has given us the uh, word for which we are responsible. It's our task to carry this to the world, our responsibility. But that word, Paul describes it as the power of God unto salvation in the beginning of the Roman letter. Well, again, Looking back at verse 8, he says, To me who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. These unsearchable riches were not only unsearchable to the Gentiles, they were unsearchable to the Jews too <laughs> because it wasn't what they expected. It wasn't in some cases, what they wanted. They wanted a king. They wanted someone to come and set up a throne in Jerusalem. They wanted somebody who was going to reign down here on earth and who was going to elevate the, the uh, Jewish nation above the rest of the world and make them a sort of nobility among all the population of the earth. That's what they sort of had in, in mind. And yet that wasn't what God had in mind. So we see Christ coming. We see individuals such as the Apostle Paul preaching these unsearchable riches of God. All right. Now the idea of trust, trusting in God's unsearchable riches or in God's uh, the abundance of his doing, the uh, uh, fact that what he does is above all that we imagine, uh, above all that we consider. This idea is not new. Do you realize if we go back, we find people in the Old Testament trusting in God? Uh, first one I thought of was Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and how that 
they <laughs> uh, became at offense in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar, and he decided to, to uh, uh, give them a little global warming <laughs> in his fiery furnace. And uh, their statement to him was that God was able to save them. God was able to rescue them. And it says when they came out of the furnace after Nebuchadnezzar had his men throw them into the furnace to die, when they came out, it said there wasn't even a smell of smoke on them. So you see, God was able to do far more than Nebuchadnezzar ever dreamed of. Maybe even more than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego dreamed. They knew that God could save them, but they didn't know how. They didn't know how, what that would look like. And so here they came out of the furnace, didn't even smell like smoke. Well, they trusted in God's ability to do abundantly beyond what they could imagine. We find other examples in the Bible of this, that uh, uh, Jesus, for example, when he spoke to the, uh, to the Jews on one occasion, uh, Luke chapter three and verse eight, uh, he spoke there and he said, therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to our, yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. There are a lot of stones in West Virginia. <laughs> you realize that God could do with those stones what he decided to do? He could make of them whatever he decided. It's beyond our imagination. We're trying to figure out how to get rid of some of them. <laughs> a few years ago, somebody drove, uh, I think it was a, a Halloween night or something. Anyway, they drove a four-wheel drive vehicle through the neighbor's yard across my yard and over into a grassy place across the street and cut a couple of donuts over there in the grass. And so the uh, community association came by and they said, would you mind if we put some stones around the edge of your yard? Well, I thought, you know, a few pieces of rock like this around the edge, maybe one every four or five feet when they came, they were like this. <laughs> and so I've got about six or eight of them at various places around the yard. Certainly they'll stop a vehicle from, from going across the yard. <laughs> but, uh, but I've always wondered, now if somebody runs into one of those, whose responsibility is it going to be? <laughs> Unfortunately, even uh, those old people like me in that neighborhood have been able to keep their vehicles on the road. <laughs> and I haven't had a lawsuit yet. But in any case, uh, here Jesus speaking to the Jews said something that they couldn't have imagined. If God wanted to, you know, you're, you're claiming your, your greatness because you're descendants of Abraham. If God wanted to, he could take those stones there and make children for, for Abraham out of them. It wasn't what God wanted, but God had the ability to do that. So, God lesson there or the lesson of, of Jesus to those Jews at that time is God chose you for a purpose. God chose you for his purpose, not because 
you were a great nation, not because you were numerous, not because you were powerful, not because you were better than the rest of the world, but God, because God had a purpose in mind. And here we see in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul alluding to that. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think. So, that must have been a, a difficult thought. In fact, it was so difficult that the majority of a nation rejected it, rejected God's plan. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Unfortunately, those are adverbs. <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> your, your thought is correct. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes uh, when, we, when we look at the things that God does, and at the time that, that things are happening, we read in the Old Testament many accounts. And at the time they're happening, we wonder now, what's the purpose of this? Why, why is that? Why did things happen that way? And here where he talks about uh, uh, this, this power of God that's beyond our understanding and beyond our grasping, uh, beyond... The, the people who lived at the time that Jesus was, was on the earth. Uh, this power is working in you and me if we're doing what we're supposed to do as Christians. But anyway, I want to go back a little, a little further again. In, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 20, uh, it says, He, that's Abraham, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Think about what happened to Abraham, his situation. Abraham was born in Chaldea. Uh, apparently, he, he grew up there. Uh, I think he was somewhere around 70, 75 years old uh, when, when the story in the Old Testament picks up. Here's Abraham, and God calls him. Abraham lived in a pagan nation. We don't have any, uh, any indication that Abraham was a follower of God before God called him. And yet, when God did call upon Abraham to leave his nation, to leave his family behind when he, when he got up to, uh, to uh, Haran, 
It's not enough that you just leave this pagan nation, but Abraham, leave your family behind and go to a place that I'll show you. That must have been a great decision for Abraham to make, and yet he trusted in God's ability to do what he said he would do. God promised Abraham that he would make a nation out of him, and yet for years and years, Abraham had no children. He finally chose Eliezer and said, I'll make him my heir. And God said, no, you won't. He's not the one I want. Later on, he and Sarah got in their mind that they would solve the problem with Ishmael. And God said, he's not the one either. You see, God had in mind all the time what he wanted done. He had in mind all the time the direction that he wanted things to go and the one through whom he would work. So Abraham trusted God. He believed God. He believed that God could do exceedingly abundantly above all that Abraham asked or thought. So we have an example in the Old Testament. This has been proven. It's already been shown that God, when, when God uh, does something, that is beyond the idea of man. You know, in, in uh, Isaiah, there's a statement that God makes, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. And that's so true. When we look, uh, well, uh, it's almost a, a joke anymore to watch the, the news and to see what our leadership in this nation is doing or in this world, to see what people are doing in an effort to solve problems. And sometimes they ignore the problems and solve things that don't really need to be solved. But be that as it may, uh, we see that, that God's ways are not man's ways. Abraham believed God. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter four and verse four, it says there that the faith that Abraham had in God was accounted to him as righteousness. Does that mean that Abraham was righteous? No, it means that God made the decision to account to Abraham righteousness because of Abraham's faithfulness. That was a, that was a principle how many thousand years ago? 1,400 and, well, I don't, I don't remember the exact figures, but uh, over 1,400 years before Christ, that uh, Abraham believed in God and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Do you realize that the same principle is true for you and me? If you are faithful, if you believe in God, if you trust him, if you do what he tells you to do, that can lead to righteousness for you. Not because we do everything right, but because God is willing to forgive through Christ. What a blessing we have. And what an inconceivable thing. You know, the pagans in the time of Abraham and on down to the time of, of, the, of Israel and Judah, the pagans in those days, they spent all of their time trying to please a God who really didn't exist, but they tried to please him all the time. If something went wrong, if there was a, an earthquake, oh, Baal must be unhappy. We've got to 
do something to please him. If there was a tornado, the gods are unhappy. And so it went. This, uh, this was something that man had conceived. And yet, the God of heaven was there ready to forgive, ready to aid, ready to help, if man would just turn to him. You know, a couple of times in the Old Testament, uh, the scripture brings it right down to the bottom line. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to be merciful, and to walk with the Lord your God in humility? You see, bring it right down to the bottom line. And you know something similar to that is repeated in the New Testament. What does the Lord require of you? But to do what's right and walk with him. All right. So in this, uh, we notice here in after, after Paul makes the statement about what God is able to do, the exceeding abundance of what God is able to do, that he says, to him be glory in the church by, Je by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. How is God glorified? How, how is it? What, what happens that brings glory to God? In uh, John chapter 17 and verse 4, we find a long prayer there. It goes through most of the chapter. Uh, Jesus praying to his Father. And uh, in that, he talks about how he has glorified God. He said, I have glorified you. I have done everything that you sent me to do. There's our example. If you want to glorify God, do everything that he sends you to do or tells you to do. That's what makes God happy. <laughs> you know, uh, I've always, uh, I get irritated sometimes with the translators. Uh, and in the uh, Roman letter, at the beginning of the uh, uh, 12th chapter, it talks about that uh, we are to be acceptable to God. Well, that word acceptable, maybe, maybe in 1611, when the translation was made into English, the word acceptable meant a little more than it does nowadays. But nowadays we have people talking about this is unacceptable or that's acceptable. And what they mean is it just gets over the line from unacceptable. The word that's translated there is the word you areston in Greek. And it means well-pleasing. This is what, what, what God wants. He doesn't want us to be merely acceptable. He wants us to be well-pleasing. And we see that in individuals like Abraham. We see that in individuals like Daniel. Uh, we see that in, in uh, the Apostle Paul. That the Apostle Paul did everything that he could to be well-pleasing to God. The Apostle Paul talks about, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and, and verse 8, he said, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Think back with me for a little while, uh, back into some of the examples in the Old Testament. I think of, of Elijah right now because we've been <laughs> talking about him in the class on Wednesday evening. Um, 
But God has some tasks for Elijah to accomplish. But Elijah had two arms, two hands, two feet, one head, just like the rest of us. He was just another man. How did he accomplish those things? How could Elijah confront 450 prophets of Baal and succeed? Because God gave him what he needed to succeed. When Elijah was in the midst of the famine that God had sent, Elijah announced it, but God caused it. How did Elijah survive? Well, God sent the ravens to feed him. God provided what he needed in order for him to accomplish God's will. When he got to the, to the house of the widow in Zarephath, and the widow said, well, I've got just enough flour left and a little bit of oil so that my me that I and my son can make a meal and then we'll die. We're going to starve to death. And yet as long as Elijah stayed there, the flour never ran out and the oil never ran out. I can't imagine what the meal looked like, but <laughs> be that as it may, God provided. When we think about Israel coming out of Egypt, they're carrying what they have. They're carrying what uh, God has provided. How did God prepare them for that trip out into the wilderness and to have what was necessary for building the tabernacle? He told them to go borrow from your Egyptian neighbors. So they borrowed silver and they borrowed gold and, and uh, who knows what else. Whatever it was, it was sufficient. And when they got out in the desert and God began to give them instructions about building a tabernacle, and if you read the, those instructions, they're lengthy, they're detailed, but they're also very expensive. Where did all of that come from? Well, it was because God had prepared the way for them to have what was necessary to accomplish his will. And we can find so many examples in the Old Testament of that, of that same principle, that God provides what is necessary for his people to accomplish his will. Here we, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this uh, Mystery, the revelation of God revealing himself, revealing his will to mankind. Well, in all generations, God has given what was necessary for man to do what God wanted done. Notice what it said there in verse 21. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In all generations, God has given what was needed. Okay, the Apostle Paul, he talks about the abundant grace of God in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you having all sufficiency in all things. See there? All sufficiency in all things. You know, if you, if you look at the time of Christ, the time uh, even after Christ ascended into heaven, 
What was going on in the Roman Empire? How was it living in the Roman Empire? Was justice everywhere? <laughs> Absolutely not. Was, was kindness, was peace existing? No, none of these things. What about the Romans' slavery? The city of Rome, it's estimated that there were over a million people in the city of Rome on welfare in the first century. Now we think we discovered the idea, but in the first, uh, in the first century, the city of Rome imported more than 220 million tons of grain from Egypt in order to feed the welfare recipients in the city of Rome. Did Jesus go to correct all of those things? Why not? Do you suppose that pleased God that there was injustice, that there was oppression, that there was evil going on in the Roman Empire? Do you suppose that pleased God? Absolutely not, but the point is, in spite of all of those things, if one kept the word of God, he could get himself ready to live in eternity with God in heaven. It would be great if in our world we could always have the ideal situation. But the picture that we see in the Bible is that in most cases, the ideal situation didn't exist. The ideal circumstance where everything was rosy and everything was in order, this didn't exist. And yet God provided a way for man to be saved. God provided a way for a man to live pleasing to him in the midst of all of this. All right. Yeah. Yes. In, in some ways, the, uh, if we were to outline uh, Ephesians and to outline the book of Romans, we see s similar things. Present the, I hate to call it theory, but that's, you know, the difference between uh, theory and, <laughs> and, and what is not theoretical. Uh, the theory, the principle of our faith in God. Uh, we, can, we can read that and we can understand it as a theory. What we need to understand is the application. So similar to Ephesians, if you look at the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters give us the theory of our religion. The last chapters tell us how to put it into practice. And so we find the Apostle Paul hasn't deserted that idea. <laughs> he, he uses it more than once. And uh, so we may see some elements of that when we look at the book of Ephesians. And of course, in this case, we're looking at Ephesians and Colossians together I haven't said much about Colossians, but uh, 
the two uh, they don't repeat each other but they do uh, uh, you can line them up side by side but uh, the Apostle Paul in uh, uh, the things that he preaches uh, let's see there he talks about uh, uh, that in any time or any place or any circumstance, God has given us what's necessary to be pleasing to him, to serve him. Uh, that God is able to keep whatever commitment we have made uh, with him. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 talks about the Apostle Paul said that he understood or that he was confident that God was able to keep whatever he had committed to him for, for the future. Unlike uh, human beings, God doesn't forget unless he decides to. Now the only time that we have an assurance of God's forgetfulness is when he says, I will forgive and forget. I will forgive and remember no more. This is a promise that's very valuable to us, something that means a lot to us because all of us can look back in our life and say, well, wish I hadn't done that. Even though I know God has forgiven me, I would hate to stand before the throne of God on the last day and say, well, I forgave you of all these things, but I want you to look at the list here and see how much I've done for you. That's not gonna happen. He said, I will forget and remember, or forgive and remember no more. Uh, unfortunately, the clock doesn't forgive and it does remember. <laughs> and we got 37 seconds. So, uh, uh, we're going to have to stop at that point. There's a little more uh, that I wanted to say, but uh, the principle of God's ability. Uh, remember the, uh, the 19th Psalm, for example, uh, talks about how God's, uh, his greatness is revealed in the things that he's made. The heavens declare the glory of God. The earth shows his handiwork. All of that would have been useless if we don't go further down in the 19th Psalm and it talks about the Word of God because God tells us how these things are of value to us and how to reconcile these things so that we understand that doing God's will is more important even than the heavens and the earth. I think we've been uh, overruled here, so <laughs> we'll stop at this point.